Chapter 2. Here's the rub. If I wake up now, I will need to get up, because if I try to sleep for the next 15 minutes, then I will just feel exhausted when I need to be up with alarm. I hate this dilemma. Get up now and start the day, or rest a little longer, maybe reach deep dream sleep only to have it broken by the alarm. She was thinking these thoughts, as she normally did daily, yet was also very unaware of these thoughts and would most likely not remember them within 45 seconds of being out of bed. Out from under her cozy, warm comforter, her head no longer resting upon the pillow that cradled her neck so near to perfection that she barely noticed the pillow at all. Yet she still had those thoughts, and it was a subconscious working of her mind to ease her into the day. Rolling her shoulders while laying on her back was the first full locomotion of her waking day, and she rolled with the momentum and lifted her torso upward, swinging her legs over the side of her bed slowly. She placed her hands on the edge of the mattress as her feet touched onto the floor. With a deep inhalation, her neck and back straightened from the slouch, and she imagined her blood delivering the nourishing oxygen to the muscles as she expelled the carbon dioxide that would feed the spider plant hanging from her ceiling, which, in turn, would produce fresh oxygen for her use. Meridia opened her eyes. Once again, in the middle of it all, she accepted the early light of day casting its spell through her window, caressing her back and placing her shadow on the wall next to her door. It was in these moments that she pondered how she got here. Each day when she rose with a day before her, she looked at her life as it was in that moment and reconciled how different it had become than what she had thought it would be. She was in her thirties, college-educated, physically fit, and health-conscious in all the right ways, well-traveled, living in three different European countries earlier in her life, and a mother to a fabulous ten-year-old girl with golden blonde hair, who was still asleep in the other room, and would be for the next ninety minutes. Meridia awoke, an hour and a half before her daughter, because Meridia is a good mother, a damn good mother, a single mother. She ran her hand through her short hair, savoring the sensation as her palm first smoothed her follicles and then flicked them as her hand moved back over her scalp. She recollected those times when her husband's hand caressed her neck as they embraced, but not her husband, no. Her ex-husband's hand had once been the appendage that caressed her regularly. And she needed to remember that the tiny phoneme of X would be the signifier that she needed to use in her thoughts to help her move on from the eleven-year marriage that had ended a little over two years ago. Yet she could indulge herself in these early hours of the day and delve into her own thoughts and emotions. It was her time, and she would do with it as she will. So she willed herself to her feet and walked the short distance to the bathroom, the apartment was functional, and at times she resented that she was there at all. But then she did not resent being there truly. Rather, she resented that she still relied on her ex-husband to afford the rent. The bastard should have to pay because she gave him years, tears, laughter, and life itself. She turned on the light. Maybe she was bitter, and needlessly so. She would not look herself in the eyes, nor at her reflection at all, though. They had met right after she had graduated from college, 
and enjoyed the early twinges and thrills of love. The dates, the courtship, the sex, the first fights, the reconciles, the proposal, enough, the water. The city might still be on level two water restrictions, but she was going to splash some onto her face. The cool liquid provided a changeable kindness, and she let it wash over her hard exterior. Before it could all slide from her cheeks into the sink, she splashed a second set of cupped hands worth of water upward to her face and watched as it dripped from the part of her brow just above her nose. She shut off the water and listened. The silence after the sound of the water running let her know Minnie was still fast asleep. The silence let her listen closely to find her heartbeat. It still beat. It was not without love, so why should it not beat? Maybe the deep chasm of her divorce still resonated with shrill echoes of lost love. Maybe she would find someone other than her ex-husband to be emotionally connected with in such a way that the hours, the days, and months of leaning on her ex-husband after the miscarriage would seem minuscule in comparison. Damned she felt because that bar was set very high for any new relationship she might forge in the future. But she would be damned if she would let him walk away with more than he did, with her hope to feel, with her hope, and not just with her time and feeling from those times spent, that life of hers which she will always have in memory. She would be damned but for her choice to find her blessings and be saved from damnation. She awakens early and allows herself to feel bitter and remorse and even hatred for him, because if she does, then she can have time with her daughter, Minerva, and feel with her. She refused to be rendered an empty shell by his leaving, so she lets the last of the water on her face remain when she opens her eyes and looks at herself in the mirror. And she sees how she is to blame. The boy was not ready for what came and could not be comforted by her while she was finally wrapped in motherhood. Minerva entered her world and she put all her focus onto that child. She barely registered when her hus ex-husband's startup business failed. She only noticed on her periphery when it was in its final throes, and he found employment with a company on another continent. She had packed up and managed the sale of the house and moved overseas for what wound up being three years. They returned to Texas, and he promptly left for half a year to North Dakota for a contracted job. She came to expect him to be distant, and that was her folly. In that folly was her fault for the failure of the marriage. He returned, but he didn't really return. It dragged out so long that it was a strange relief when he finally moved out, and a pain of the royal sort when he filed and served her with the petition for divorce. Standing up straight, she looked at her body in the mirror, the body that she had worked at keeping in such sexy shape just to spite him. He would not have her again, so he might as well suffer in knowing that he will never have what looks this good. She stretched her back to her left and right. He paid child support and alimony and covered all of her living expenses as she became certified as a massage therapist. She enrolled her daughter at a very prestigious private school, and her ex paid the tuition. His daughter, too, she was surprised, she said aloud, 
and promptly sighed with the understanding that her interior monologue on the matter was something she needed to keep in check and move beyond. She walked from her bathroom to the living room, grabbed her rolled-up yoga mat while she went. She unrolled the mat with a flick of her wrists. She unrolled a final negativity coming to her usual terms with how she had gotten here, here being this two-bedroom apartment in downtown Austin, one of the hippest and most happening spots to be. This apartment was closer to the school her daughter was in than her previous apartment, and was not the apartment where her and her ex had last had sex. The apartment in which she lived humbly with her daughter, for which the rent was paid in part by her ex-husband and part by her work as a massage therapist, work she had not intended to do professionally, but she was good at performing, was her domain. She began her yoga positions, astutely aware of muscles and how they reacted to each of her movements. She harkens back to her education, her interdisciplinary studies that yielded her Bachelor of Arts degree. Although she was considered a journalist, her studies ventured into the roots of language, the veritable forum of the divine in how humans communicate. The reason why humans hold onto specific sounds, creating images that represent those sounds, resides in the means by which we process sound. The temporal lobes of our brains decode sound to discern meaning, be it language to express truth or idea, fable and fiction, and all else in between, or perhaps to know the joys of music and the pains expressed by those who would master such a craft, or maybe with all our might to come to terms with the resonant vibration of the sum total of all vibratory mass of our cells combined that resolutely defines the very essence of our beings. Like a rowboat adrift on the seas, there was no oars about it. There were ands where oars would be, and her tenacity at dissecting language while she moved and held forms was a good sign to her mind that she was finding freedom, not by running, not by hiding and avoiding, but by embracing, by holding until an absurdity of language made sense to her, and she would not be constrained by conventions of language, stance, and being as she became the real person, clear and forthright in her expression, that she knew herself to b She coughed. A tickle at the top of her throat spurred the bodily reaction, and she involuntarily coughed and quickly placed both feet on the ground. She repressed a second cough and craned her neck toward Minnie's door. She quickly cleared her throat as quietly as possible and then listened for any stirring from her daughter. No movement, not even the slightest bit. She could feel an unfounded nervousness begin to rise, but it was quashed when she heard a reflexive sigh coming from the room in which her daughter, she was now sure, slept. She aimed herself upon herself once again and contemplated the two paths her mind had taken this morning. Her body and mind would be yoked together by her efforts and focus, but how to carefully achieve it was now her task. She would have all day to quickly ponder and decide upon a large myriad of choices improvising her way through providing the stability that the beautiful creature of her daughter would require in order to develop well into her own true self and brilliant being. Meridia would be right in the middle of it all again soon enough, but now she knows, and knows well, 
what course she will take. She let her mind be and pictured the fine enjoyments that she had discovered since the divorce. When she did have time to herself, time when Minnie was spending the day or weekend with her father, Meridia had taken up painting. She had, the first time she found herself alone in her apartment, gotten out her old pack of charcoals and a pad and proceeded to draw and redraw and throw out and redraw again the image of her daughter from the picture in front of her at the kitchen table. The event was strenuous and by that right liberating much like the pose she is holding while thinking back to that time. Adjusting her posture and focusing on her breathing, she remembers getting the image reproduced on the pad to the extent that she felt proud of her skill, and she remembers being of such uncertainty that she would need to test her appraisal of her skills in a forum that would allow her to compare it to others, not in competition, but by mere contrast. She searched online and found a local group of visual artists who would meet in the downtown area or from one of the vantage points outside of the downtown area that gave ample view of the growing skyline complete with cranes and paint, sketch, or draw in some manner what they saw. All mediums were welcome, and the group cost nothing. So she took her charcoals and went that afternoon to where the group would meet up. Once there, she realized she had tricked herself into socializing. More often than not, the people she spoke with were friendly and willing to chat, A few were somewhat incapable of carrying out a conversation due to their age or inexperience in socializing. Some were downright brooding as though they were actively seeking to suffer for their art and making a clear show of their suffering to others. Mostly, though, the group offered her conversation outside of the forums related to her daughter, her massage profession, and her now defunct marriage. Implicitly, however, the group offered a staunch challenge to her own set of skills as a visual artist. She watched the creative processes of others and saw their creative products. She adamantly refused to be intimidated by some of the other participants' skills in recreating the image of the building they were all trying to capture. She instead decided to be intrigued and inspired. Happy with the form she committed to paper, she decided to up her game and ventured to a local art supply shop, joined their customer club to get a 15% discount, and purchased brushes and watercolor paints in a wide array of colors, a knife, a watercolor pad, and a set of pencils, a set of wax pencils, and an extra set of charcoals. Some of the most intense times of relaxation since that moment onward involved her spending hours previously designated for sleep, hours after the bedtime stories were read following the struggle for brushing Minnie's teeth, Hours when she would otherwise have used the laptop, tablet, or smartphone to pass the time glancing over various social media websites as a passive observer. She found there to be a better sense of purposeful being in creating, in developing her own latent talents and skills, and embrace the times when she would sit for longer than she realized at her kitchen table, trying to recreate the image of photographs she had taken over the years. While changing her bodily position and feeling the tenuous pull upon her muscles, she smiled through what would otherwise be discomfort as she thought about her insistence on pursuing visual artistry 
over spending time online. Some of the websites were great for killing time, but why would she kill to feel like she was living? If she was killing time and time was hers to do with as she pleased, was she not killing herself by simply killing time? Meridia knew life was to be lived for the sake of the actions themselves, and, whereas she might not find greater function for her artistry other than it engaging her with a sense of greater purpose, she was well aware that such a sense of being was the best that she could muster given the road she had traversed to bring her to where she now was. Standing in her living room, she finished her yoga routine in the early morning hours while her mind wandered to the countless occurrences of self-development that came to her effortlessly as she worked her form of magic upon the page of the watercolor pad using color and shape, salt and wax, and wrought into existence tree and cloud with other attributes by the sheer finesse of action inherent in her practical mind and movements. Her eyes transmuted with the help of her hands, the images of past moments captured in photographs. She created new versions of those moments. Scenes and skies, persons and silhouettes, implied motions of winds carrying who knows what precisely. All were the fodder by which she felt herself improving beyond the person she had been once, the person overwhelmed by the heartache of a love lost to time and changes. She sits down and reaches across to her phone on the small side table that stands next to the couch. After verifying the time, she sets an alarm to sound after silently counting down the 20 minutes she would use to attempt her meditation. She sits upright, straightens her back, and closes her eyes. Her mind gives her image of the last picture she looked at last night while painting. One of her and her hus ex-husband at a small cafe near the dam where they enjoyed an outing as a family after Minnie turned one. She recalls the joyous feeling from when the picture was taken and the almost sickening regret she felt when seeing it last night. To better understand herself and focus her concentration properly, she leaned into the image and noticed someone in the background of the picture that she had not noticed intently before. A young woman who looked remarkably like one of the teachers she had seen at Minerva's school this year.